Why don't you stand? We're going to begin this worship service this morning at the baptismal font, uh, where we welcomed uh, three uh, new children of God at our 8 o'clock worship service, so that was wonderful, and uh, where you're um, going to join with me in confessing our sins. And we do that at the baptismal font because it's here our, our sins were first washed away and forgiven, uh, which we uh, trust God will do over and over again in our lives. Uh, so... Uh, uh, we lift this confession up in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, so that we may worthily, worthily love you and magnify your Spirit in all we do. Amen. If we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is gracious and just, will forgive us our sins, now and forever. So let us with confidence uh, ponder for a minute on those sins of the past week, those things that keep you away from God, keep you from being who God longs for you to be, and then we'll join in together for confession. O oh, merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will Walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, who has given his son to die for us, for all of our sins. I got messed up. In the mer <laughs> and forgive us all of our sins. As a congregated minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of your sins. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us sing. Let streams of living justice flow down upon Oh, 
service with this apostolic reading. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, also with you. and let us sing a song of praise. Glory to God in the highest, the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Glory to God in the highest, the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Let us pray. Holy God, we gather this morning for worship. May the songs that we sing and the words we share be sweet music for the heavens. And we pray, Lord, in the midst of this worship, that your spirit be received and shared abundantly so that we might be people of justice and peace, sharing kindness and walking humbly with our neighbor. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, children can come forward for a children's sermon led by Adam. Good morning. Man, I thought it was just a 9.30 kid thing. All right, let's try this again. Good morning. Good morning. All right, that's better. Okay, we'll let that one go. All right, so we got something coming up in a couple days. Um, it's not really a holiday, but I think we like to think of it as sometimes, though no one gets it off of work. Does anybody know what's happening in a couple days? It has to do with, what was that? Valentine's Day is coming up in like a couple weeks, yeah. But in a couple days, we do this thing where we rely on an animal to tell us what season is coming up. Yeah. Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day, that's right, that's right. It's not really a holiday, but I think we like to think of it as a holiday sometimes. Uh, so we rely on this animal, right, that... Uh, uh, his name is uh, Puxatawney Phil, um, and I'm not sure if he's like a junior, a third, fourth, because he's been around forever. Uh, and so, uh, but but he he we he is in uh, in a box area, and he kind of comes out of his hole, out of his cage, and and if he sees a shadow, he runs back in his hole, right? And that's supposed to mean that we have uh, several more weeks of winter, okay? You hope he sees a shadow this year? Do so you want more winter? All right. That's good. And so, yeah, because snow days, right? We want more snow days for them, right? That's what we need, right? And so, uh, but, 
and then if he doesn't see a shadow, he comes out and he's hanging out. It means more, spring's coming, right? It means spring is coming. That's what I hope for. But, um, so I figured since I can't really bring a critter into the church, uh, it's frowned upon, I have an eight ball. An eight ball. <laughs> I got a magic eight ball because I think the outcome's pretty much the same. So, Mr. Adam here, Adam, I, 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 I love some sports. And uh, so, now, there's some events that are coming up this year, and my team is not in the Super Bowl coming up, or playoffs even, or <laughs> someone else has got eliminated pretty early too, so, uh, <laughs> but, but, but there's always next year, and that's kind of my mantra, and my, you know, my thoughts. So, I, 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 I'm going to ask the eight ball a very serious question, okay? Well, I'm not going to ask it. Well, let's see. Let's see. Will the groundhog see its shadow? We'll ask that first. Let's see. You may rely on it. Okay. So it might see its shadow, which means it runs back in the hole, and that means more winter, right? Uh, will the Cleveland Browns make the Super Bowl next year? Yes. So you're saying there's a chance. All right. So this is good. This is good. This is good. Um... And, and then, just for fun, let's see if Pastor Carl's team, the Vikings, will go to the, any type of playoffs next year, too. All right? Let's see here. Uh, my reply is no. <laughs> well, every once in a while, okay? So, all right. So, that's about as reliable, right? But I want to tell you guys that we have this amazing book that God gave us with his word in it, and it's called the Bible. And the Bible has all of the answers we need. We don't need a magic eight ball. We don't need a groundhog. We don't need, uh, up, up where I'm from, Sandusky, they have a fish that like eats a certain piece of food and it's supposed to tell you what season's coming. We, we don't need any of those things. We don't need any of those things. All we need to know is that God's word, God's Bible, with all the beautiful seasons that come through it, is what God has told us we need and will give us all of our answers. And there's so many things that happen. You'll hear some scripture later today uh, for those that are in worship this afternoon. Uh, you'll, you'll hear the Beatitudes and it says, for those that are sad, you'll be happy. For those that are worried, you'll be comforted. Uh, all those things. And so just remember that, that God's love is so much stronger than any animal that tells you what the season will be or any eight ball that gives me hope for a football season next year of joy. And so, let's end in prayer and we'll send you down to Sunday school, okay? All right. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your love. We give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks that you comfort us, hold us, and love us always. Let us remember that no matter what season we are in. In your name we pray, amen. All right. Miss Sally is waiting for you guys. If you want to wait for me down by the back door, I'll walk you guys down, okay? reading from Micah, the sixth chapter. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me! For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam son of Beor answered him. And what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord? With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? 
Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be God. A reading from 1 Corinthians. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The word of the Lord. Let us stand and welcome our gospel this morning. Our Holy Gospel today is from St. Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 12. Lord. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. I have a little bit of a confession today. In addition to being Groundhog's Day, the 2nd of February is a celebration called the Presentation of Our Lord. It's the last gospel text, the last piece of the festivals around this time of year that are still focused on the infant Jesus. It's the, the presentation of the infant Jesus in the temple. So in my household, Lynn and I figure as long as we can get our Christmas decorations down by the 2nd of February, we are within the acceptable range of concluding Christmas. And we did that this week, packed things up this weekend, got it in just in the nick of time. The other thing we like to do every year is to make sure that we listen to every single song in our Christmas playlists in the course of the season. And we had to finish a few this, of those this week as well, but we managed to get that done before the 2nd of February also. But one of the songs that we hadn't heard earlier, but is in one of our playlists, is a song from 1966, some of you will remember that, um, by Simon and Garfunkel. So it's called, <coughs> excuse me, it's called The Seven O'Clock News and Silent Night. And you may have heard it, it starts out with those deep, resonant harmonies of Simon and Garfunkel singing that treasured Christmas hymn of Silent Night. It just, it's so warm, it just envelops you, it wraps you up in its love. But as the song continues, over the top of it, or really woven into the midst of it, they play um, portions of, an actu of actual news, it's not the actual newscast, but it's a reader of the actual news from one day in the summer of 1966. And it is stories of war, stories of crime, stories of brokenness, things that are hard to hear and hard to experience. And that, that story, those stories, get woven in to the song Silent Night. And the two of them have to kind of coexist together. And I thought of that story, of that song, as I heard it this week, I thought of it especially as I was preparing the sermon for today and thinking of reading all of our three, our three lessons for this morning, but also reading them against the background of our news this week, right? So over the top of this story of blessing, of the promise of, of God uh, enacted through the words of Micah, enacted through the letter to the Corinthians from Paul, and certainly the story of um, the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount, over and against that, of course, right? There's the actual human brokenness of the world. There's the release of the heartbreaking and tragic and brutal murder of Tyree Nichols. There's the war in Ukraine and its potential escalation at any given moment. There is the um, shooting attacks in Jerusalem and in multiple sites in California and you know, at any given time in our communities and in our city. And then that's only the things that might have been on the news if we were to weave it in. But if I went around this room and asked you, I'm sure that in your own lives, you also had your own kinds of news that had to lay themselves down against these texts. If you were to look just at my social media feed and um, folks sharing things with me, you'd see an older relative who fell and broke a hip and is doing fine, but that's always so scary. And a younger colleague, much younger than myself, whose sudden death occurred this week. And a friend who moved from Ohio to Texas at the beginning of uh, this academic year to teach uh, high school music. 
and um, went through his first really significant tornado that tore through that town and the lives of his, his class and all those who were in that school district. And in the face of all of that, we still hear these wonderful texts woven in with those kinds of stories. Scholars tell us that um, the Sermon on the Mount, of which the Beatitudes is a part, is really the, the, the focus text for the way Matthew tells the gospel story of Jesus. Up until this point, through the fourth chapter of Matthew, um, was Jesus, you know, besides the birth and the announcements and the visits, um, it is the, uh, the you know, visit of the Magi, and then we see the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And as people were beginning to respond to him and crowds are beginning to gather, they come to this place and Jesus calls them up on the mountain in Matthew's gospel and begins to teach them about what he is about, about his mission and ministry, about the kingdom, the reign that he is inaugurating. And scholars say, if you want to see what, what kind of gives you a heads up of what's coming in the rest of Matthew's gospel, you can look at these three chapters at the early part of Matthew that tell the Sermon on the Mount. And if you want to see where the Sermon on the Mount is going, you can look just at the text we, see we heard today, just at those first 12 verses, those Beatitudes. Because what Jesus is saying here is one of, well, one of the things Jesus is saying is that you know how the world says what, what kinds of people are to expect blessings and privilege and good fortune. And Jesus says, look, this new kingdom, it is something different. This new reign, it is different. God is going to gather up and align God's self with the broken and the hungry and the meek and the poor. Those are the ones who are going to be caught up in this transformation turn on its head sort of vision of the kingdom. And as Jesus is telling that, we read this story this year at least. If it, actually, I have not been here very long, and this is the second time I've preached on the Beatitudes because Luke's version of the Beatitudes we had at All Saints Day. But when we hear it now, when we hear it in, in, uh, from Matthew in the days of Epiphany, it's a part of Jesus' revelation, right? It's a part of the epiphany of Jesus telling and showing who he is and the world in which he is calling us to participate. And in spite of the fact that it's about the world turned upside down and this promise of a new reign, the fact of the matter is, it was there in the prophets. You can hear it in Micah this morning. You can hear it in this call, this reminder to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. You can see it happening right there. Lutherans are always on the side of being cautious when we hear stories and texts that seem to make it um, that there's a, you know, like kind of this one particular thing we have to do in order to sort of gain God's favor. And so we rightly resist that, but that does not mean that we have not listened to these texts, texts such as the Beatitudes, and heard in them a calling, a calling to walk and align ourselves with who Jesus is and with his ministry with his revelation in the world. Some of you know that part of my life I also spend in the world of higher education. And one of the things that we talk about a lot in education is a, having, the difference between having a fixed and a growth mindset. That language, whoops, that language comes from um, scholar Carol Dweck, who did some research with, with young people and discovered that you know, students who feel like they're abilities are fixed. And maybe, maybe they start out understanding that, that to be fixed at a high point. And maybe they're told early on, you are smart, you are creative, you are athletic. And that seems like a good thing, of course, right, to say to kids. We want to say that to young people. But what she found is that when, when students hear that as something that is about their character, then they struggle when they meet something that's hard to do because they think it, it proclaims them no longer smart, or athletic or artistic. But students who instead have heard, you can grow, you can learn this, you can get better, you can develop. Those students, when they meet things that are challenges, often just embrace the challenge and allow themselves to sort of become more than who they are. I would like to think that we hear the Beatitudes whenever we hear them read and listen to them with a holy growth mindset. To say that we understand that we do not nail this all the time. 
that we are very frequently on the other side of the story. But we also know that we are called to be one with anyone who is struggling, with anyone who is poor or hungry or meek or broken or sorrowing. We are called to everyone to be a part of that, in part because at some point in our life we will also be those things, and in part because as the body of Christ, we are always those things if there is someone who is suffering in our midst. But we can read this text and have a growth mindset and see in it Christ's revelation to us, inviting us to live into this promise and to this hope, to make it a little more well um, uh, delivered and kind of transformational in our midst. This is an especially good time for this text because there was a baptism this morning at 8. There's First Communion going on um, at this season. It's stewardship season. And all of us, that means all of us are figuring out what does it mean to walk wet away from this font, as Pastor Carl said a couple of weeks ago. What does it mean to look at our gifts and our resources and our community and say, how do we walk as Christ calls us to walk? How do we do justice? and love kindness, and walk humbly with all that we are, and with all that we have. One final um, sort of thought about that this week. Both Carl and I graduated from Trinity Lutheran Seminary, which is just down the road in Bexley. And if you've ever gone past the seminary, you may have seen that right on the corner of um, College and uh, Main Street, there is a um, sort of great sculpture that sort of rises up into the sky. It's called the Promise for Life. And the Promise for Life sculpture was created by Alfred Tibor, who was a Holocaust survivor. He just died not that long ago. He was in his 90s. But when he was, I don't know, you know, a few years before his death, I heard him speak about the Promise for Life. I think it was a celebration of the, some commemoration of when it was created. And one of the things that I heard then that I hadn't heard, and I'd been giving tours around this st statue and the sculpture and um, kind of sharing things about it, but there was a story I had never heard before, and this is it. That Alfred Tibor and his entire family are from Hungary, and his, his immediate family, his extended family, all found themselves in the concentration camps during the Holocaust. And out of all of their family, 80-some extended members, only Alfred and Andre, his brother, survived the concentration camps. And they had another brother, and when they came, when Alfred and Andre came to the United States, they came through Ellis Island, and they were asked to put down their last name on that form. Instead of giving their last name as the name they had when they were born in Hungary, they gave the name of their lost brother as their new last name, Tibor was the older brother of the oldest brother in that family. And as I hear these stories today, as I hear Micah, as I hear the First Corinthians te text, as I hear the Beatitudes, and as I understand them to be a part of Christ's epiphany, of Christ's calling us and revelation to us of how to live in the world, I honestly am not sure I can think of any better image than the image of carrying our brothers or sisters or siblings' names with us. Those who are heartbroken, those who are meek, those who are hungry, those who are lost, those who are grieving, of remembering that we ourselves, as we walk from these waters, we bear the name of Christ and we bear our siblings' burdens. We are a part of this community called to be a part of a new reign, a new example of how God fiercely loves God's children. As we do that this day, as we remember that this day, I think we are indeed all called to walk humbly, to do justice, to love kindness, to proclaim blessing, and to love as fiercely as God does. Amen. Please stand and let's sing uh, musically these Beatitudes that Pastor Sherry just preached on.
gather our hearts and voices in shared prayer this day. Let us pray. 
God of light and peace and hope, we give you thanks that you have called the church to grow, to be more, to love fiercely, to follow where you would lead. On this day, this morning, we celebrated around the font new life for Jennifer and Kayla and Andrew. We pray for their walk in faith and that they might remind us and call us to live out our faith in new ways as well. God of wonder, we give you thanks for this planet on which we live, for all of its diversity in animal life and in um, environments. We pray for those who are impacted by um, climate change and by severe weather, wherever it might be. And we also give you thanks for the beauty of this earth. We know that in these days of winter, the promise of spring and new life is still coming. We invite you to make us good stewards of this earth and this planet. God of mercy, we pray for those who have asked for our prayers, those who are on our hearts and minds this day especially those on the hearts and minds of this community. We pray for Lois and Kimberly, for Meg and Susan and Jennifer and Sherry, for Karen, Joanne and Adam, for Kelly and Sonia and Alyssa, for Teresa, Cynthia, Marshall and Nancy. We pray for those prayer requests that um, were gathered by our online community and another service this morning for Rogeria and Phyllis and Man Man. And God, we pray for comfort for all those who cry out in sorrow and grief. For the family and friends of Donald, Andrew, especially for Betsy. For the family and friends of Colin Saffel, especially for John and Joanne. For all those who pray for comfort for the family of Tyree. God of grace, make us a part of the healing work and the hopeful work and the fierce love you are offering in this world. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. <clears throat> the, the peace of Christ be with you always. Let us greet one another with that sign of peace. Uh, have a seat, and we will have our special music from Camerata, and the good gift they'll bring while you share whatever good gifts you brought for the kingdom today.
please join our uh, choir and stand as our uh, offering is brought forward. Let us pray. Holy God, we give thanks for these gifts of wealth that's brought forward today, along with gifts of food and talents and singing and, and sharing your word. May we use all of this abundance of gifts so that your name might be made known and that this world might become a place of justice and kindness. Amen. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed our, our duty and our joy that we should give thanks and praise to you, Almighty God, for the gift of Jesus who has revealed your revelation of love and forgiveness. So with all the world, we are reconciled with you now, God. And so we sing with this heavenly song, this unending hymn. this morning for gathering us to be your people. We give thanks for this creation, uh, a world in which that we are called to be stewards of. We give thanks for your promises, Lord, a promise that brings us life, life everlasting. We're trusting the promises of Jesus, Lord, as we gather around this bread and wine, the promise to meet us in this meal when we call and ask as the body of Christ. We're remembering the promise that Jesus made to his disciples on the night he was betrayed, where he took bread, broke it, and gave thanks, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, and he blessed it, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a sign of the new covenant shed in my blood for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this wine, we proclaim the mystery of faith, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Delight us with your love. Send us to be your people. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
seated. We'll commune those who are at home worshiping with us right now and those who wish to commune in their seats first. Here, Emma, put that on the baptismal pot or on the tray. We'll do that with these communion kits. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. We invite others forward now to commune with us in this space. Please know that we believe that Christ's presence is real in the midst of this worship, in the midst of this meal. Come and enjoy the promises that have been made to us. is bread, here is wine, Christ is with us, he is with us, break the bread, taste the wine, Christ is with Life forever. 
Let us pray. Holy God, fat and nourish at your table. May we go out now and be your people forever and ever. Amen. Someone left me a tip up here. <laughs> we, uh, we got some uh, question, uh, questions. Uh, Wednesday, uh, just a few announcements. That's where I'm going with all this. A few announcements. Uh, Wednesday, we're eating 4.30 to 6. Uh, Marty Marzetti, which is Chef Marty's uh, take on the uh, Columbus uh, uh, spaghetti casserole thing that, uh, that I never heard of until I moved down to Columbus. <laughs> so that's 4.30 to 6. And then we are very excited to have um, Pastor Kathy, who's been worshiping with us uh, uh, since the fall uh, from Texas, a retired pastor, uh, has written a book, like, like a real book, that you can go on Kindle and buy, and uh, uh, that I went on Kindle and bought and, and read, and, and Kathy's right here in this space, and, and uh, she's going to spend three uh, Wednesdays with us from six to seven. Uh, it's called the Mayflower Chronicles, and, it, and it's uh, historical fiction, but the, the fiction part of it is that it gets uh, deep into the lives after a lot of a historical study. Uh, of both the uh, Pilgrim, that, that community from uh, England uh, that, that came, and also the Native Americans that were here uh, to, to, to welcome them and, uh, and to be in community with them. And, and it's a very faithful story, and so she's going to share uh, those points that meet Christ in, in the midst of this story, too. So we're, we're pretty fortunate to have this. So that's going to be the next three Wednesdays from 6 to 7. Uh, and so I encourage you to be part of that. We had such a good turnout for uh, our, uh, welcoming our neighbor uh, that Lindora and I thought that we needed to come back after we heard from these three different um, refugee and immigrant groups to kind of talk about what we heard and what we think and what ministry we might be able to do. So we put that on after Pastor Kathy's done with the Mayflower Chronicles. So we're going to come back to that on February 22nd, which is also the beginning of Lent. That's Ash Wednesday, February 22nd. So just to give you a heads up. The only other, two, only other thing is next Sunday is Scout Sunday at the 930 service. And also where we're going to encourage you to bring back those commitment cards that we send in January. Um, thinking and prayerfully about what you'll be able to do to uh, share your wealth with God's world and, and, and make ministry happen in this area. Uh, so... Be faithful in that if you're a member of this congregation or an active part of this place, and, and we'll have a good celebration next Sunday. Let's stand. We'll have our blessing. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you all with favor and grant you God's peace. Amen. Let us sing.
We are called to serve one another. 